This is the video for A4.2 on conservation of biodiversity, and it's part of the core or standard level content. So let's talk about this word biodiversity. Bio meaning life, diverse meaning differences. So we're talking about all the variety in life, and we need to be able to think about this on several different levels. So we can have ecosystem diversity. So I'm gonna have different environments and different types of organisms that are living in there. So like a desert is a different ecosystem than a coral reef. I can have species diversity. So just looking at the many different species that might be present in an ecosystem. Or even within a species, I can have genetic diversity. So a poodle is a very different type of dog than a Great Dane. They're both the same species, but they do have variety there. Estimating the number of species on Earth is really hard. So the, the current estimate is somewhere between two and 10 million species of eukaryotes. And I know that seems like a really big range, but I think that represents the fact that we acknowledge that there may be species that exist that we just haven't either identified yet or haven't identified as being separate species. And in terms of prokaryotes, different species of like bacteria, wow, lots of species there. They're very hard to count. Um, another topic for another time. So it's also hard to tell how many species once existed. The problems for counting current species are big enough, but when you think about extinct species, that's very hard to estimate. But we can tell through things like fossil records that there have been just these cycles of increasing biodiversity throughout time and then mass extinctions. So increasing biodiversity is lots of new species being formed and then extinction, new species being formed and extinction. And so this cycle has continued um, throughout Earth's history. Now, we're currently in a cycle of increasing biodiversity, but if this pattern holds true of increase extinction, increase extinction, this increase in biodiversity has to end at some point. One of the biggest differences between the next mass extinction and previous ones is that the next mass extinction, or if you wanna say the current one, is anthropogenic in its cause. So anthropogenic um, means caused by humans. That's where this prefix anthro comes from. And this can be due to a variety of things, whether that's over harvesting and things like poaching, habitat loss, um, invasive species um, causing extinction of endemic or um, you know naturally occurring species. It could be due to pollution or just global climate change in general. But the ecosystem loss and the biodiversity loss that we're currently seeing is definitely due to some human activities, which is different than mass extinctions um, earlier on in Earth's history. Some of these human activities can cause ecosystem loss, and an ecosystem can be defined as the biotic, that is the living, and abiotic, that is non-living, factors in a given area. Now they're of course dependent on each other, but like biotic features would be like the plants, the animals, the fungi, the bacteria that live there, and abiotic factors would be things like water, sunlight availability, rocks, of course they're inter dependent, but they all form what's called an ecosystem. Ecosystem loss is a big problem being driven by a lot of human activity. So whether that's dams or mining or exploiting the land for resources, there are lots of things that are causing this ecosystem loss. Um, a good example of ecosystem loss, not good for the ecosystem, but good for using an example, is the Aral Sea. So this is what it looked like before, and this is a body of water that was fed by two rivers. Those rivers were diverted for irrigation and the creation of farmland, which is great if you're a farmer, bad if you are a, an organism living in this sea, because as you can um, see from this picture, now that sea is no longer able to support the same kind of life that it once did. You'll hear many people refer to the decline in biodiversity right now as a biodiversity crisis. So what makes this different than the mass extinctions of Earth's past 
is that it's just an unprecedented loss of ecosystem, species, genetic diversity. We know that that natural cycle exists, but this is just unprecedented in terms of the scope of, of the loss of biodiversity. And there's a lot of evidence that points to that. Um, evidence that's been put together by an intergovernmental agency. So inter means between. That means it's going to be from not just one country, but a lot of them. Um, this intergovernmental science policy platform on biodiversity and ecosystem services, it's a long name, um, has compiled just very convincing and broad evidence um, about this biodiversity crisis. And so they're looking at a lot of different pieces of evidence. They're looking at degradation of habitat. They're looking at species diversity. They're looking at the ranges of organisms or how big their populations are. They're even looking into genetic diversity. So the key here in supporting this idea that this is an unprecedented loss in Earth's history is that we gather lots of different kinds of evidence um, for this argument. Now, one of the pieces that they'll be using to support this, or at least measure um, biodiversity loss, is what's called the Simpsons Diversity Index. Okay, so here's how that would work. To find this diversity index, you would take the total number of organisms of all species in an area. So I'm counting everything. And I'm gonna multiply that by that same number minus one. I'm then going to divide that by the sum, that's what this means, the sum of the number of individuals of a particular species, so if that's one species that I wanna take a closer look at, times that same number minus one. Okay, so we'll do a worked example in just a moment, but the key here is we're going to get a very high diversity index when I have lots of different kinds of species and I have an evenness. So richness is the number of different kinds of species. Evenness means not dominated by any one type of species. So high diversity uh, indices are good. Um, low di diversity indices are bad. And these are the two things that it's taking into account. Let's do a worked example here. So in two places, place A and place B, I found three different species and I counted how many of each uh, species, how many individuals there were. So to calculate the diversity index, I took the total number of all the species, so that would be 28 times 28 minus one, and I'm gonna divide that by the number of each species times that number minus one, and I'm gonna do that for all of the species here or all of the individuals for each species. And then once I find this sum, okay, I'm going to divide this by this sum. And for place A, I'm getting a um, diversity index of 3.7. So we can do this together for place B. So to find that diversity index, I want to take the total number of individuals from all species, which is 27, and multiply that by 27 minus one. I then want to divide that by the sum of um, the different species numbers. So I would take 15 times 14, so 15 minus 1, I should say, and I'm going to add that to 9 times 9 minus 1, and I'm going to add that to 3 times three minus one. Now when I do this, I'm getting um, in my numerator 702 divided by 288, and that gives me an index of around 2.4. So here I've got two different indices for two different places. Which one has the higher diversity? Well, that would be place A. It has a higher diversity index. Why does it have that? probably due to that species evenness. Look, in place B, it's really kind of more dominated by one species, where in place A, that's more evenly distributed. Um, there's lots of different applications here, but hopefully this helps you get started with this. So now that we've got lots of evidence to convince ourselves that we are in fact in the middle of a biodiversity crisis, before we can talk about what to do about it, we really need to understand what are those root causes. So again, in these past extinctions, um, this has been due to things like volcanoes or asteroids, things like that. The current mass extinction is again anthropogenic in cause, so caused by humans. 
This is really related to overpopulation. So there's a dramatic increase in the biodiversity loss. Um, they're not necessarily new problems. Humans have been um, you know, using habitat for farming for quite some time, or they've been diverting water for irrigation for quite some time, but it's on a much greater scale now. Again, because we have a lot more people living on Earth than we had before. And now that we understand the magnitude of this problem, we're obliged to help prevent some of that massive biodiversity loss. Now, when we're thinking about conservation efforts, it's important to note that using multiple different strategies is always going to be better than relying on one single strategy. But any strategy can be categorized into two types. So one type is called in situ. So that's conservation in the natural environment. And generally what that means is that I'm taking some kind of natural environment and I'm creating a protected area. Protected area would mean I can't do things like hunting, or if I do, it's really under controlled um, conditions, or I can't develop that land into like, let's say a neighborhood or a farm. So protected areas. One of the reasons why this is great is because it doesn't uh, disrupt the natural behavior of those organisms, right? They're in their natural environment. They're still doing all the things they would normally be doing. And so it's also not going to interrupt um, the evolution of those species. They're still in their natural environment. So when we think about their traits and which traits are going to have an advantage over others, that is in clear um, you know, connection with their natural environment. It's generally more cost effective, okay? Um, but it can involve active management. So you may have to try to remove invasive species that are there, or you may have to try to manage predator populations, or you may even have to feed them if things are too far gone. But all of these are things that are happening in situ in the natural environment. That's very different than ex situ or outside the natural environment. So this is when we are removing individuals from their natural environment and placing them in something like a zoo. So if I were to take some of these penguins out and put them into a zoo as a conservation effort, that is ex situ. This might involve captive breeding and then releasing. So we've seen this a lot in recent years with like rhinoceros species, okay, removing them, um, trying to get them to breed and produce new offspring and then releasing them. Um, so obviously this can be um, quite cost effective and there can be some problems there, but it's a good way to at least start preserving endangered species. So species that wouldn't be able to regenerate or at least not very quickly in their natural environment. And also it may involve the preservation of like sperm or egg or seeds. So I might not even be able to do a full captive breeding program. I might just save like sperm or eggs or embryos, or if it's a flower or a plant like seeds um, in a way to um, ensure that I at least have that genetic diversity available later on down the road. With such a massive loss in biodiversity, it's becoming more apparent that we cannot save all of the species from extinction. So with our conservation efforts, we really have to focus those on very important species. So how do we determine which species are important and should receive a lot of our conservation efforts? Well, this is um, the goal of the Edge of Existence program. So edge meaning evolutionarily distinct and globally endangered. So that means two things. That means we're looking for uniqueness. That's what we mean evolutionarily distinct. So these are organisms that maybe don't have other closely related species, that they're very unique. Okay, and globally endangered means that they have a high likelihood of extinction in all places, not just in one area, but all of the populations in different areas. Those species that meet those two requirements are what we call these prioritized species, okay? And this is the goal, again, of the Edge of Existence program, that we're not just looking at all of the endangered species or threatened species, but we're identifying those very unique ones um, and giving them most of our conservation effort.